This is the nuclear age, the age of the always present threat of instant and total annihilation. How did we get here? How did it all begin? It was born in another time, in a world like this. 1945, a global war fought by great navies and armies, great numbers of men and weapons, as wars had always been fought. Until 8.15 on the morning of August 6, 1945, when a single plane carrying a single bomb opened the age we now live in. The decision to drop an atomic bomb on the city of Hiroshima was perhaps the most important decision of our time. The controversy at Stern has gone on with rising intensity ever since. How was the decision made? Why was it made? Could the instant destruction of Hiroshima of 70,000 Japanese men, women and children have been avoided? In the spring of 1945, it was known that an atomic bomb would be made. All that remained was to decide whether and how to use it. This is the story of the 135 days of that decision. The first day, April 12, 1945. We interrupt this program with a special bulletin. A press association has announced that President Roosevelt is dead. The president died of a cerebral hemorrhage. All we know is that the president died in Warm Springs, Georgia. He has been president for 12 years, longer than any other man. He is the only president many have known. Now, on this April afternoon, with the United States at war around the world, he is suddenly gone. Now, someone else must make the life and death decisions. The vice president is almost unknown. He has been in office less than three months, obscured by the dominating figure of the president. Now, he is president the leader by chance of the greatest military coalition in history. And takes the oath of office he never wanted to hold. Assumes the responsibilities for which he has had no time to be prepared or brief. He says, the moon, the stars, and all the planets just fell on me. He says, pray for me. He tells his cabinet, no one can fill the void that has been left. He says he will try to carry on Roosevelt's policies. When the cabinet leaves, one man stays behind. 78-year-old Secretary of War Henry L. Stimson, weary but iron-willed, with a secret he must now tell the new president. The moment is described by his friend and biographer, McGeorge Bundy. Mr. Truman tells of that conversation in this language. Stimson told me he wanted me to know about an important project that was underway, a project looking to the development of a new explosive of almost unbelievable destructive power. That was all he felt free to say, and his statement left me puzzled. It was the first information that had come to me about the atomic bomb, but he gave me no details. The Pentagon. The project to build the atomic bomb has been given the code name Manhattan District. It is being built under the direction of a recently promoted Brigadier General of the Corps of Engineers, his name is Leslie Groves. He reports only to Army Chief of Staff George Marshall, Secretary of War Stimson, and the President. A few doors away, the future strategy of the war is being planned. Few of the planners have been told the secret of the bomb. On Capitol Hill, the congressmen who have appropriated $2 billion for the Manhattan District do not know on what the money is being spent. In laboratories around the country, there are men who know the secret. The scientists are deeply worried by the implications of the force they are about to let loose on the world. As Harry Truman comes to speak for the first time to a joint session of Congress, he has much on his mind that takes priority over the atomic bomb. He is still forming his administration. He is still learning his job. Pressing problems around the world demand his attention. Foremost among these is the global war the United States is fighting. 
Our demand has been, and it remains, unconditional surrender. For the next 11 days, the president has no time to think about a secret weapon that may or may not work. On the other side of the world, in the Pacific, on the islands and coral atolls, the Japanese are resisting fanatically. The toll of United States dead and wounded on the beaches and in the jungles is rising. April 25, 1945. As the conference to organize the United Nations begins, State Department policy planners still have not been told about the bomb. The president still has not been briefed. Worried by this, Secretary of War Stimson arranges to see the president. Mr. Stimson took with him to that meeting a memorandum which uh, he kept among his records and which tells very clearly uh, the way in which he then uh, saw the matter. He pointed out uh, that while the United States was ahead in developing the weapon, it would not remain ahead indefinitely. Certainly would not preserve a monopoly forever, and that the nation which would catch up first would be the Soviet Union. He pointed out that the weapon and its use were not merely an immediate military question, but a political question since this new force threatened the very existence of civilization. The president indicated his feeling that it was sound and that there was no reason to make any changes in our course of action. As May begins, the Red Army is advancing street by street through the burning ruins of Berlin. The Nazis announce Hitler is dead. The war in Europe is ending. But even as the last bitter battle is being fought, the problems of post-war Europe the war in the Pacific now begin to occupy the minds of the political leaders. Stimson again meets in secret with the president. Uh, the secretary recommended the establishment of a special committee called the Interim Committee to consider all aspects of the matter, and in particular the immediate and pressing question of the relation of this new weapon uh, to the war against Japan. May 8, in Europe, after four and a half years of war, 20 million dead, Germany surrenders unconditionally. Will the same bloody battles have to be repeated across the Japanese home islands? This is the question United States military planners must now answer. May 9, 1945, the war in Europe is over. The nations of Europe lie in ruins. Thousands are hungry, without clothes, homeless. The United States and the Soviet Union begin to quarrel over the future of Germany and Eastern Europe. Winston Churchill urges a Big Three meeting before United States troops are sent to the Pacific. Washington, in answer to Churchill, the president tentatively agrees to a July 1st meeting. Secretary Stimson urges delay. It may be necessary to have it out with Russia on her relations to Manchuria, Port Arthur, and other ports of North China. Over any such tangled weave of problems, uh, this secret would be dominant. And yet there was a problem, as the diary entry goes on to say, in the fact that we would not know by the 1st of July, in all probability, whether or not uh, the weapon was, in fact, a success. And the secretary noted that it seemed a terrible thing to gamble with such big stakes in diplomacy without having your master plan in your hand. May 25, the Joint Chiefs meet to talk about plans for the war against Japan. The next step to be taken after the Okinawa campaign. The Navy advocates blockading Japan, invading the China coast. The Air Force wants to force Japan to surrender with its fire raids. General Marshall favors invasion of the Japanese home islands. Admiral Nimitz and General MacArthur concur. Chief of Staff Admiral Lay agrees, but he says the invasion could cost up to a million American lives. The decision of the Joint Chiefs is to recommend to the President Operation Olympic against Kyushu in November. 
coronet against Honshu in the spring. The Joint Chiefs do not consider the atomic bomb. They do not know if it will work or how effective it will be. Meanwhile, Japan is being destroyed by conventional weapons. A record 400 B-29s attack Japan with firebombs. The Japanese are being burned in their cities from one end of the homeland to the other. Behind the walls of the Imperial Palace, the leaders are divided on how to face the looming disaster. Marquis Kido, Lord Privy Seal, advisor to the Emperor. At least one city, and at times two, was being turned into ashes daily. I don't know how many cities there are in Japan, but I realized that they would all be leveled in time. With the winter approaching, tens of millions of people would die a dog's death from hunger and exposure. And I said to them, how can we carry on the war under such condition? Colonel Hayashi, Secretary to War Minister Anami. It was our hope that we would be able to deal a heavy blow to the American landing forces. And this victory would induce the Americans to propose the termination of the war to us. We had no delusion that this blow could finish off the American strength, but we clung to the hope that this would give us a bargaining vantage to ask for better terms in the peace treaty. Washington. The president delays the big three meeting. This is Stimson's idea. He wants to have the bomb ready before the president meets Stalin. Later, back at the Pentagon, Stimson sends for General Groves. He asked me what uh, uh, cities I was planning on bombing, or what targets. Uh, I informed him and told him that Kyoto was the preferred target as the first one because it was of such size that we would have no question about uh, the effects of the bomb. He immediately said, uh, well, I don't uh, want Kyoto bombed. And he went on to tell me about its uh, uh, long history as the cultural center of Japan, the former ancient capital, and a great many reasons why uh, he didn't want to see it bombed. Kyoto is removed from the target list. The second target on the list is Hiroshima. May 31. The headlines report the fire raids on Japan have left one million homeless. The Japanese dead now number in six figures. Air Force General LeMay says, we are driving the Japanese back to the caves. In this atmosphere, the interim committee meets to recommend to the president how to use the atomic bomb. In this connection, uh, General Marshall did say, as a kind of passing thought, I, I don't put it any higher than that, that perhaps it would be a good idea to invite the Soviet Union to send observers to the test at Almogordo. Uh, this suggestion was not taken up by anyone else and was quickly passed by. Mr. Burns felt very strongly at this stage that we should not share any information with the Soviet Union, nor should we make any immediate overtures to them. The meeting continues behind closed doors. Other points are raised. And I believe that the horror of the war that was on and the horror of the war which military planners expected to continue for a long time was so very great that uh, it was more or less taken for granted that if a new weapon could put an end to this agony, it should be so used. Any weapon that would bring uh, an end to the war and save uh, the lives, uh, save a million casualties among American boys uh, was justified. At lunchtime, Mr. Burns asked Dr. Lawrence to raise again the question that had been raised earlier, simply in passing, 
namely that the weapon should not be used against the Japanese in the war, but that there should be a striking but harmless demonstration of this weapon in the hope that the Japanese might be persuaded to sue for peace. Coupled with this demonstration, of course, was the possibility that the weapon might have to be used subsequently if the Japanese were not sufficiently impressed. Remember, none of us had then ever seen a bomb go off. We had no idea as to what you could do or what sort of effect it would have. Someone finally said, unless these, this weapon is used with maximum impact, it may be very difficult for anyone to see much difference between it and the firebomb raids that were going on at that very time over Tokyo. June 1, the headlines say, B-29 fire raids burn 82 square miles of Japan. The divided Japanese leaders continue to argue about what to do, how to halt the slaughter. As this goes on, in Washington, the interim committee makes a unanimous recommendation to the president. Use the atomic bomb against Japan without warning. June 18, the main public event in Washington is a hero's welcome for General Dwight Eisenhower. As Eisenhower rides down Pennsylvania Avenue, at the White House, a decision is being made. Secretary Stimson and the Joint Chiefs meet with the President. They tell him there is no alternative to invading Japan. They estimate the war will end in the fall, 1946. The atomic bomb is mentioned, but it has not yet been tested. No one knows what it will do. A delay in the invasion plans is not considered. The president agrees he has no alternative. He orders the Joint Chiefs to go ahead. Machinery for the first stage of the invasion begins to move. The invasion will be here. Kyushu, D-Day, November 1. In Japan, on a similar map, the same problem is being examined by Lieutenant General Arasue. Those of us in the second department, the G2, had to consider whether the American forces would try to land in the southern Kyushu or on the Kanto plains. Our conclusion was that if the Americans landed on southern Kyushu, our present forces alone would be sufficient to fight off the Americans. As the interim committee confirms its recommendation to use the atomic bomb on Japan, the battle for Okinawa ends. In three months, 98,000 Japanese have died. There have been 80,000 American casualties. On the atoll of Tinian, 1,000 plain B-29 fire raids are being prepared against Japan. Standing by is the mysterious 509th Composite Group. It has no bombs, goes on no raids. Its crews do not know the time for its mission is now only six weeks away. But now in Washington, some are reconsidering that mission. I felt rather strongly that we should have a, sp a specific warning. We should tell them just what it was that this word atom bomb uh, connoted so many things that this would uh, be of deep... Uh, significance. It was definitely seemed to me that the Japanese were uh, ready for surrender. They were becoming weaker and weaker. They were surrounded by the Navy. They couldn't get any imports in and they couldn't export anything. And naturally, as time went on and uh, the war developed in our favor, quite logical to uh, hope and expect that uh, with the proper kind of a warning that the Japanese would have, uh, would have uh, made peace. I remember that we first responded to the question, what do scientists think, by saying that they think a variety of things and this is only natural. Uh, on the one hand, they hoped that this instrument would never be used in war and therefore, they hoped that we would not start out by using it. 
On the other hand, they hoped, or other people hoped, that it would put an end to this war, save countless lives, put an end to a, 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 a butchery that had been going on for many years and had been marked by atrocities, concentration camps, murderous raids on cities, on Rotterdam and Dresden and Tokyo itself. A number of people um, began arguing that we should not use the bomb militarily because Germany was obviously collapsing and the Japanese were suffering many reverses. And so there was a great deal of discussion within the laboratory about uh, unwisdom of using the bombs militarily. You ask yourself, would the Japanese government as then constituted and with the bitter division between the, the peace party and the war party, would it have been influenced by a, an enormous nuclear firecracker detonated at great height doing little damage uh, and your answer is as good as mine I don't know I know only that I was told that an invasion was planned that it would be necessary and that it would be terribly costly and it is this information which Oppenheimer told us and it certainly had some effect on me, and I began to think that maybe under these conditions, such an in enormously drastic step as a military use of the bomb would be justified to reduce the total number of casualties and end the war much sooner. At sea, July 8th, on board the cruiser Augusta, en route to the Big Three meeting. The president now knows the bomb test is scheduled for July 15. Now the waiting begins. Japan is in ashes. The situation is growing more desperate every day. But the army and the foreign office still quarrel over what to do. The army agrees to seek peace, but only if the Soviet Union is mediator. But Stalin has promised to enter the war against Japan in return for concessions in Manchuria. He leaves for the Big Three meeting in Potsdam. On the Augusta, the Japanese effort to get Stalin to intercede is known. The Japanese diplomatic code has been broken. The president knows of the division among the Japanese leaders. Alamogordo, New Mexico. At the bomb test site, the scientists are working under growing pressure. They are told there must be no further delays. The president must know the results of the test when he meets with Stalin. In mid-July, a car arrives at the test site. In the back seat is the plutonium for the bomb. It is 48 hours before H hour at ground zero. Sunday, July 15, 1945, Almogordo, New Mexico. It is D-1 for the test of the world's first atomic device. In the bunkers, the scientists and the generals wait. No one is quite sure that the $2 billion device they call the gadget will work. The weather is checked. Preparations continue. The scientists make up a pool on the power of the device. Fermi suggests it may blow up New Mexico. As the waiting goes on, the tension increases. Certain observations couldn't be made, and there was even some danger of fallout going to the wrong places. Back at the base camp, about five minutes, two or three minutes before the explosion, uh, we all uh, got on the ground, face down, away. Which was closed by McKibben at 45 seconds before the zero hour. And uh, at that time, Don Hornig took over the stop switch. My hands were on the switch, and then I could hear the timer counting three, two, one. Then all of a sudden, an incredible flash of light illuminated everything 
many, many times brighter than sunlight does in New Mexico and uh, at noon on a bright day. Many miles of the desert were completely blinding, and so I actually lost uh, my vision for a few seconds. When it recovered, I turned back, and I saw a huge ball of fire, bright yellow, rising through the atmosphere, and the whole atmosphere in the direction of the bomb was filled with strange violet light. It was one of the most aesthetically beautiful things I have ever seen. On an enormous scale, this cloud was peach and pink and purple. We knew the world would not be the same. Few people laughed. Few people cried. Most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. After the atomic test, the scientists find the desert at ground zero turned to glass. The earth lowered nine feet. General Grove's message to the American leaders meeting at Potsdam with Stalin and Churchill is sent in code. It was the news we had been uh, expecting day after day, and it gave us a feeling of, uh, of confidence uh, to uh, uh, defend ourselves uh, in the future, bring an end to the war uh, desired by all men. We didn't have any celebration, but we, uh, there isn't any question of the great uh, relief that uh, uh, we had. At 5.10 on the afternoon of July 16, 1945, at the Sicilian Hof Palace, the meeting of the Big Three begins. Stalin says the Russians will enter the war against Japan by August 8. He does not know, is not told about, the new card the president now holds. In public, the big three are cordial. In private, friction increases. They bicker over the boundaries of Poland, over Eastern Europe, over Germany. The wartime alliance is breaking up. At Potsdam, in the moments before he must approve the final order, the president once again goes over the alternatives with his advisors. And it was, uh, it was important to bring about uh, an end to the war, and if possible, uh, to do that before Russia came into the war. It would have come out sooner or later in a congressional hearing, if nowhere else, just when we could have dropped the bomb if we didn't use it. And then, uh, knowing American politics, you know as well as I do that uh, there had been elections fought on the basis that every mother whose son was killed after such and such a date, uh, the blood is on the head of the president. The question was whether we wanted to save our people and Japanese as well and win the war or whether we wanted to take a chance on being able to win the war by killing all our young men. The final decision would rest with him. It was an awesome responsibility for him. But he could see no alternative and agree. Three B-29s arrive at Tinian from the United States, bringing the last components of the bomb to the 509th. The 509th is now ready for its mission. Now at Potsdam, one final move. John McCloy, 
One of the great uh, questions was what we were going to do about uh, the Russians and the bomb and whether we should notify Mr. Stalin about it. We finally made up our minds that we had to, being partners, uh, but uh, the question was what his attitude would be. And that afternoon, at the conclusion of the uh, conference, uh, President Truman walked around to Stalin uh, with uh, Chip Bolin, our interpreter, and uh, he told him uh, substantially this, that uh, we uh, want you to know, uh, General Lissimo, that uh, we have uh, now developed uh, a, what we call a secret weapon, which is uh, of uh, tremendous power and uh, which in a few days we hope to use in the war against Japan. Well, knowing what he was going to do, I watched uh, intently uh, Mr. Stalin's face. Pretty much said, well, that's fine, just we'll, uh, we'll use it, and uh, what, what, what's the next item on the agenda? It let everybody down terribly because we were so worked up emotionally over this thing. I have always been of the opinion that Stalin did not grasp the importance of the uh, statement. Potsdam, one day after the bomb order goes out, an ultimatum is delivered to Japan. Despite the urgings of the State Department, it does not specifically tell the Japanese what they can expect if they surrender. Absolutely futile. There is still time, but little time, for the Japanese to save themselves from the destruction which threatens them. July 27. The ultimatum reaches Tokyo. In Japan, a million people have died in the fire raids. Food, fuel, clothing are running out. Isolated behind the palace walls, the leaders meet to consider the ultimatum. It does not tell them whether or not they will be allowed to keep their emperor if they do surrender. Once again, the leaders are deeply divided. July 29, the Japanese answer is, we will moksatsu the ultimatum. Ignore it. Kill it with contempt. August 1. As he leaves the Big Three meeting, the president hears the Japanese answer, interprets it as a rejection, does not recall the bomb order. Thus, the decision which the future will endlessly debate is taken. The atomic bomb will be used against Japan. Tinian, August 5. The bad weather of the past three days has cleared. Final preparations for the dropping of the bomb are made. In Tokyo, the divided leaders still argue over how to bring the war to an end. On board the Augusta at sea, the president waits. And at 245, they roll down the runway center runway of three on the two other runways were observing airplanes between nines which were to accompany the strike plane the load was very heavy the load of the bomb the fuel was a very heavy load for the plane and from tempest the pilot held the plane on the runway almost from the last two feet of the runway and the last moment he lifted the plane and sailed off and then start her off toward Japan. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. The bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki ended a war, so made it wholly clear that we must never have another war. There is no other choice.